At the start of this school year, Ontario announced a three-year strategy to address issues of educational fairness and the systemic barriers that can stand in students' way. To oversee that plan, the province tapped former human rights lawyer and assistant deputy minister Patrick Case to head up the newly established Education Equity Secretariat. And he joins us now for a look at what his new job is all about. Mr. Case, nice to have you here. Thanks for coming in. Thanks very much for having me. What is an equity secretariat? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> in essence, it's a hub. A hub to what? It's a hub of people who are focused on addressing equity in education. And um, it, the sense is that um, the, both many, many of the boards and also the province have been focused on equity for a long time. Mm -hmm. But that there are some issues that have been fought, uh, hard to move. Like what? Well, um, one of those things has to do with the diversity of teaching staff in across the province. It is not diverse now. It is not as diverse as it should be. As it should be. That's correct. What, uh, I mean, do you have a target on what you think it ought to be? Well, I think that the uh, children should see themselves reflected in school staff. Sure. Beyond that, uh, children across the province should be able, should see uh, racialized teachers, should see um, teachers from different backgrounds in their classrooms as well. So I'd like to cut to the chase here, Mr. Case. Are you saying we Case. got... Case. <laughs> you saying we got too many white teachers? Is that the problem? Well, it's not that there are too many white teachers. There aren't enough racialized teachers. And the reason for that is what? The reason for that... Reason, the reasons for that are multifold. Um, one of the things is that, uh, um, that a lot of racialized kids don't see themselves in classrooms. Uh, they don't see themselves in classrooms as teachers. They don't see themselves in, uh, in, cla um, in, in classrooms doing the job, right? So that's, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, we want to change some of that. Of course, that starts before um, university and down in, in the high schools. Um, and so um, our strategy is to work with schools, work with uh, uh, various level, levels of government to change those, uh, those, that picture. Do we know what the percentage is of so-called racialized teachers in the school system? Unfortunately, we do not. And one of the reasons for that is because, um, to this time, very few boards have kept data having to do with, uh, with the diversity of the, of the um, employee populations. Would you like them to? Um, we would like them to, and indeed, at this time, there are 17 boards that have come together to look at data gathering in relation to their student populations. Some of those boards are already doing work in relation to their employee populations. What is it about, I mean, it's, I have to tell you, it's highly unusual for an assistant deputy minister to be given a high profile position like this and then come on television to give interviews about it. Normally, public servants are in the background and, and kind of like being there. So you've got a history of working in the human rights, civil rights field, in education That's as well. Correct. And what has uh, specifically the Premier tasked you with doing? Well, what I've been tasked with doing is coming up with a strategy, a multi-pronged strategy, that would address some of the, of the blockages, if you like, yes. in, the, um, in the education sector, but also in the Ministry of Education. So those blockages have to do with things like um, the, the need to give principals, superintendents, and directors the tools that they need in order to move the needle as far as equity is concerned. So you've got to spend a lot of time, I presume, meeting with them, hearing what's going on with them. That's correct. Making recommendations. Do you, do you ultimately make recommendations to somebody at the end of the day? Um, actually, no. It's no? not so much about making recommendations as it, as it is about making change. Um, the recommendations, as you probably know, have been made going all the way back mm -hmm. to, to uh, Stephen Lewis's report after the um, Rodney King yes. um, uh, incidents in the Gosh, U.S. That's, that's more than 25 years ago It already. goes way, yeah. way back. So reports, recommendations, we've seen them all. And so what's happened recently is that the government has, had, has recognized that and said, let's get down to, to, to doing some action. And do you have a term, a length of term? Two years. Two years? Yes. Can you get what you need to get done in two years? Well, what I can get done in two years is to embed some of the practices that, w that are outlined in the Equity Action Plan within the ministry uh, administration. Okay. Um, the desire is that they will then live there and carry on. Let's get inside the classroom for a second, shall we? Sure. I, I know for, you talk about for years and years, 
For years and years, there have been efforts to kind of end or reform or change or bevel the edges of streaming students into either academic or applied categories. Does right. that still happen in Ontario? Streaming still, still takes place, but I want to, be, want, to, want to be clear about this, right? Um, we're not focused right now on streaming as a structure. The fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of things that determine whether kids go into, go into one stream or another. Um, the structure is there. But so, too, um, are the attitudes of people who work with kids. Well, that's why I and raised so too, it. And so, too, are the expectations of the children themselves. That's why I raised it, because, of course, we've heard numerous times over the years that, that and I'm, I'm not making a blanket statement here, obviously, but that there are teachers who tend to stream white kids into academic and kids from so-called racialized communities uh, into applied, and, and that's where the systemic bias begins. And I wonder if that's on your plate to attempt to do something about that. Well, what's on the plate is the need to sit down with, the, with all of the partners in education. That is, with the uh, folk in the unions, the folk in, um, in the communities, as well as the ministry, to begin to understand from soup to nuts, if you like, mm -hmm. what is going on within the system. Do you... Why do, why do the numbers fall out the way that they do? And what are we going to do about it? Do you have a theory as to why the numbers fall out the way they do? Right now, what I want to do is keep an open mind about a, about a lot of that stuff because I don't want to uh, to put the ministry, teachers, or myself in a position of of saying, "Okay, here are the answers to what to what to what we're seeing." Okay. Right? And again, I'm going to I'm going to ask if you have numbers on the numbers of students who are suspended and or expelled uh, from the public system. Uh, do, do, we have a, do we have a racial breakdown of how those numbers fall out? We know that there are disproportionate numbers of racialized kids who are suspended and expelled within, within our systems. We do know that, yes. That is the case. Yes. They are overrepresented. Yes. And do we know why they are overrepresented? No, we do not. We know that, um, that in some instances what it comes down to is, uh, is people's expectations of, of kids you had at one time the um, people from folk from the Children's Aid here, and they told you about the overrepresentation of racialized kids who are in in care. Mm -hmm. And in in my view, in our view, some of the same uh, mechanisms that gives rise give rise to that give rise to overrepresentations of racialized kids in um, in suspensions and expulsions. So it may not be that they're any worse than say white kids but the expectations of those who make the decisions are different. Yes. Then that's systemic racism, is it not? That's systemic racism. Okay, so I've accurately identified that as systemic racism. So you feel you're, part of your mandate then will be to do something about that. That's correct. Uh, what can you hope to do about that? Well, I think what we have to do is to, have to work with people who are on the front lines so that we all understand what it is we're doing whenever we're doing it with regard to particular children. Um, that's what we can do. Um, the, the thing here is that it's really important to understand, we're talking about an aggregate. Right? We're not talking about the behaviors of any individual teacher or mm -hmm. any individual administrator. And so um, it's about understanding how a system operates and having people fully conscious about how the system operates in such a way that it may advantage some kids disadvantage others. Do you think at some point principals and or teachers need to be taken aside, and I don't know how the heck you'd do this, but you would know how to do this, and, and essentially said, and essentially told, right now you seem to have a zero tolerance attitude towards racialized kids when they act up and therefore they're getting suspended or expelled in ways that white kids are not. It's happening and we have to deal with it. Do you have to make that speech to them somehow? Well. I've made a speech to people saying that what we need to do is that we need to change the way that we approach um, education in the classroom. We have to change the way that we approach our expectations of kids, right? So that speech is, what, is one of the ones that I'm, that I'm making constantly to people. To groups and, all over the province. Yeah, but it's not just about speeches. It's also about giving people the tools um, that will assist in changing, changing the way that we do things. Um, one of the things that the office is involved with is um, working with teachers, and we're working right now with a large number of boards on pedagogical practices 
that will give rise to different results as far as these things are concerned. What could you change about the way teaching happens to get a different outcome? Well, um, I think one of, the, one of the strategies has to do with looking at kids uh, more directly in terms of where they come from, what their home lives are like, what the cultures around them. When I say culture, I don't mean uh, samosas and saris. What I mean is their parents' world cultures, mm -hmm. what's going on at home, what's going on in the community. And quite often what you find is that young people's minds are preoccupied with those things. To the extent that we can tap into that, we can also tap into ways, different ways of teaching because those, those experiences give rise to strategies around in relation to teaching. And we can also tap into recognizing uh, more fully um, uh, or developing more fully better relationships between teachers and students. Let me guess, though, at how some teachers would respond to that, which is to say, you want me to be a teacher? Sometimes I need to be the kid's parent. Sometimes I need to be the kid's psychologist. I need to be their sports coach, their music coach. Uh, I need to make sure they're fed. I need to make sure they do their homework. You are asking, Mr. Case, you are asking teachers to do, to assume, an even greater load, and they already think they're overburdened. But the fact is that they're not reacting that way to it. <laughs> they aren't, eh? They are not. No. What's the reaction um, you're getting? I think that the reaction, look, in the schools, the schools in which these, this, this sort of work has been done, the results have been really, really good. And, they haven't, and it hasn't resulted in, in teachers saying, you're giving us extra. What it's resulted in is people saying, oh, so that's how I can do my work differently. Huh. Now, that's a, did you expect that kind of reaction? Yes, I did. You did? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that most teachers get into the profession because they want to change the world. They want to change the world one kid at a time, one classroom at a time. And if you give people the tools to, to do some of that work, they, they accept it. Let me circle back to something you said a moment ago, which is we, we need to have a better understanding as well of the kind of home that a, that a student comes from so that when they get to school, they are in a position to begin learning. Right. And obviously, if you... Um, my sister-in-law is a teacher, and she tells me frequently that the kids who come from homes where parents have English as a second language and maybe mom or dad didn't get past grade eight, obviously that's different than coming from a home where mom and dad both have a PhD when it comes to their attitude towards education. How do you plan to get parents involved in the kinds of reforms that you're hoping to see through? Well, one of the ways we plan to get parents involved is to focus more. Um, the ministry has for some time now worked to fund parent involvement in schools. Uh, we're changing the focus of that funding so that it's, that it's focused more on moving parents who have been at the margins of schools into the center of schools. Well, we have parent councils now. That's supposed to have done that. Uh, parent councils on their, uh, on, their, on their own have not done that. But what could do that is more outreach to particular groups of people and bringing people more focused outreach particular groups of people and bringing them into the and school. How do you do that? Well, a parent council can be, some, can be sometimes a fairly passive activity. Mm -hmm. um, those who want to get involved, get involved. But what, we, what you'd want to do is to use outreach workers, for example, uh, to bring in people to school who speak different languages, come from different communities, and work on issues having to do with, with their particular interests, with their children in that school. Again, I'm going to pluck just out of thin air here an example of, of, uh, of a family that basically the, the family business is running a corner store, mm -hmm. and they're from a racialized community, so-called, mm -hmm. and uh, they're already working 18 hours a day, you know, mm -hmm. trying to run this family business, and mom and dad both work there, and maybe the kids work there sometime too on the weekends or in the evenings. How, how, do, I mean, how do you tell that family, we need you to be even more deeply involved in your kids' education, come to meetings at the school, come to meetings with principals, with teachers. Uh, that sounds like a, like a pretty heavy toll. It is. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, there are some parents who are in that situation, but not all are. Mm -hmm. And certainly, not all of those who are not, in, uh, 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 are not engaged in, in the schools at this point are in that sort of a situation. More to the point, I think, is that um, there have been difficulties or in, in reaching out to particular groups of, of parents who may have the time, however small, to be involved with the school. And why aren't that group of parents, why wouldn't that group of parents be involved right now? Well, I think they, they're not because 
the uh, sometimes the uh, parent council doesn't look like a place that they would want to be. Um, it's parented. It's it's run by people who who seem to have the time and who seem to have more of an, uh, have more of a of an in with the school. The school looks more like them, like hmm. the people who are involved in the in in the school than than it does to a lot of a parents. And so it's about changing that. How do you change the perception of the school? How do you change the way that the school looks so that people are attracted to it? Uh, we wish you well with your work, and uh, we will be happy to have you back here in uh, a year or two and get a progress report on how you're doing. Love to. That's Patrick Case, Assistant Deputy Minister, now heading up the Education, Equity, Secretariat for the province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Case. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.